back to the Fourth Way Podcast. For this episode, I had the privilege of interviewing Dr. David Vine, author of Base Nation and the United States of War. I wanted to interview Dr. Vine because I think he has a lot of experience in uncovering the fictitious world of the U.S. military and U.S. foreign policy that we citizens believe, while simultaneously showing us the real-world ramifications of our actions. The United States often perceives itself as the world's policeman, the purveyor and sustainer of democracy, and a defensive fighter who only engages enemies for self-protection and for reasons of upholding justice for the downtrodden. Before jumping into the interview, I want to point out a few takeaways to give you an easier time digesting our conversation in real time. While we ended up discussing some justice issues in history which didn't directly relate to propaganda, my conversation with Dr. Vine ended up focusing on three primary aspects of military and governmental propaganda, which you can trace throughout the episode. First, we talked about the importance of understanding motives. It is absolutely vital to understand potential motives in order to recognize the reality of a situation. The range of motives will help you to more accurately interpret information. If you didn't understand the range of motives that can exist for those who post ads on Craigslist, for example, then you might just go and meet that poor young college girl who's selling her car because she needs money to finish her schooling. And you might meet her in an empty, dark parking lot in the middle of the night. And you might find out that it's not really a uh, college girl who's in need of money, but somebody who wants your money. You can take the information that you're given on Craigslist at face value, that uh, she's a vulnerable person in need of money to pursue a good thing that she's been working hard on. But if you understand that information on Craigslist can be manipulated, and that the motive of some people is to lure you to an isolated location to steal your money, then you may pass up many offers that either seem too good to be true, because they probably are, or offers presented by seemingly distraught individuals. Motives are no less important when we get to discussions related to U.S. foreign policy. Understanding who benefits from our actions and why information may be presented in a particular way will be vital to opening our eyes to the possibility of what's going on. Potential motive doesn't prove any given action, but it opens your eyes to see what may be present. Understanding motive is sort of like a Where's Waldo book. You spend five minutes looking for Waldo and eventually find him. But then there are these follow-up quests that the book gives you, like finding his camera that he dropped or his cane or something like that. When you find the cane, you say to yourself, man, when I was looking for Waldo, I looked directly at that spot a hundred times, but I never noticed the cane. And it's because you weren't primed to see it. You were zeroed in on one narrative, one objective, seeing Waldo. Until you knew that there were other things to see, your vision was tunneled. Part of what propaganda does to us is it tunnels our vision. It gets us to see one narrative or one potential truth. And all the while that our eyes are open, we're really blinded to what's right in front of us because we only have eyes for Waldo. While motives are important to understand, they only cue us into a range of possibilities and likelihoods. They don't tell us how information is being wielded, just how it might be. But once we understand the range of possibilities, we can start looking for how information has been used against us so we can uncover truth. In this episode, we explore two primary ways in which the military has propagandized us. First, the military uses linguistic legerdemain. Dr. Vine covers a number of different ways the military has used language to soften the reality of what they've done to oppress certain groups of people, or how they hide the extent of their overseas actions through the manipulation of different vocabulary and terms. The second implementation of propaganda that we discuss is an invocation of fear. All people have strong felt needs and desires, safety, freedom, and comfort being three of the biggest. The military taps into all three of these needs and pitches to us that we should live in great fear that these three desires or needs are in grave peril. But alas, Thank God there's a savior who can uphold all three of these for us, the U.S. military. If we give them a trillion dollars a year and uncritical support for their foreign policy and the blood of our sons and daughters, then we can continue to live safely in freedom and comfort. Almost all propaganda utilizes fear as a catalyst towards belief in a product that just so happens to assuage that fear. And we find that the U.S. military is no different. So that's the basic outline of our discussion. 
And hopefully that helps you to wade through what we talk about. And hopefully it prepares you to see Waldo, his cane, and his camera. Because the topic was so dense, we didn't get to everything that I wanted to get to. So please make sure that you check out the show notes for Dr. Vine's links and for other links that I thought might be applicable to follow up with in light of our discussion. I think that's pretty much all for the intro. So here's my conversation with Dr. David Vine. So um, in this interview, I wanted to talk to you about um, propaganda surrounding the military and war. Uh, And that's because I I recently finished reading your book, Base Nation, uh, where you bring to light what those of us like me who have grown up in the U.S. might not be able to see about our own nation. Um, I, I felt like you gave me a glimpse as to why some parts of the world despise the U.S., and um, you know some of the negative impact that the U.S. military policy often has on the world that I just don't see otherwise, and um, you know the the negative impact that U.S. military policy has on the world that I, I don't see. So I would, in this discussion, I really want to primarily talk about the way that the military tries to to obfuscate some important truths. Um, so in order that that we keep buying into their sales pitch that we need more bases and we need to keep the bases that we have. And I want to talk about their their use and manipulation of information. But before we jump into that discussion, Dr. Vine, I would love for you to introduce yourself and tell us how you came to be passionate about the topic of discussion today. Well, first, Derek, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to, to talk about all these topics and complicated questions. Uh, I think like you, I had little idea of the impacts that the United States military and the United States government was having around the world for most of my life. I think I grew up like most people in the United States, going to school and getting a pretty traditional uh, education and uh, introduction to to US history that was celebratory, that was about the the heroes of US wars. The the focus on war in particular was was very, stark in portraying the United States as always the the good guys. Um, And that was the world I grew up in. And I, you know, I think I, I gained something of a critical view by going to a Quaker school. I was lucky enough to go to a a Quaker school um, that had an emphasis on, of course, uh, nonviolence and and, uh, opposition to war. Uh, But still, I, I grew up like most people in the U.S. with a pretty standard traditional view of, of the country and its its place in the world as, as being fundamentally a, a good one and not having and just having beneficial impacts on the world. Um, my story is a long one and I've probably already gone on too long, but uh, I would say that my views of, of the role of the U.S. government and the U.S. military in the world changed dramatically when I was introduced uh, to the Chagosian people. Early in in graduate school, I was introduced to these people called the Chagosians who are living in exile and have been living in exile for more than 50 years. And they've been living in exile because the U.S. and British governments forcibly removed them from their homes, from their homeland, their home islands. They are a group of people of African and Indian ancestry who'd been living on islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean until the mid 1960s when the US government came along and said it wanted to build a military base on the Chagosians largest island called Diego Garcia. Some people may know about it. I vaguely had some memory of it from the first US Gulf War against Iraq, 1991. But I knew nothing and most people in the United States know nothing of of how that base came to be, which is, in large part because the U.S., with the help of the British government, deported forcibly the entire Chagosian population and and dumped them in exile um, in the Western Indian Ocean, in the Western Indian Ocean islands of Mauritius and the Seychelles. And this is between 1967 and 1973. And around 2001, I got a phone call from some lawyers representing the Chagosians. They've been suing the U.S. and British governments to get the right to return to their homeland and to get some proper compensation for what has happened to them. 
Um, and I began to, to do some work to document the effects of expulsion that I, I'm sure most of your listeners can imagine that being forcibly removed from your home and from your islands, from the place of your birth, the place of your ancestors, the, this is not good for your health, um, to say the least. Um, uh, the Chagosians have, were plunged into profound poverty. And it's a longer story that I can get into, but their story really opened my eyes to first their story, but to the story of U.S. military bases around the world. Most people in the United States have no clue that the U.S. military maintains today around 750 military bases in other countries and colonies, 750 military bases in around 80 countries and colonies. Now, that's sort of an abstract number, but compare that to the number of U.S. embassies and consulates and missions. There are only about 276 U.S. embassies, consulates, and missions uh, compared to the 750 bases abroad. It shows how militarized our foreign policy has become. And the, the bases, 750 bases, range in size from massive, literally city-sized bases, tens of thousands of troops and family members, schools, hospitals, yoga studios, fast food, uh, all the trappings of a not-so-small American town, um, to much smaller bases. So they range in size, um, but they're all, all over the world. And this is the often the face of the United States in other countries. And it's been that way since World War II in particular, although the United States has maintained bases abroad since independence, essentially. Uh, and these bases have played a key role in launching a very long series of, of U.S. wars um, and uh, all the damage that has come with those wars, as well as having a range of damaging effects on the people living around the bases in foreign countries, as well as on U.S. military personnel and their families, and on people living in the United States. And I'll, I'll stop here, but it's it just important to see that I, I would encourage people to, to try to picture some of the infrastructure that if you're living in the United States, some of the infrastructure around you in your local community. I'm guessing there are roads that are badly deteriorating, bridges that are now in dangerous conditions, or condition, at risk of falling, um, public transportation infrastructures that have been hollowed out. Compare that to a, an extraordinarily robust set of 750 U.S. military bases abroad that U.S. taxpayers are spending around $80 billion a year to maintain, $80 billion a year to maintain the infrastructure and the troops on those bases. And just think what $80 billion a year could do to improve the infrastructure in communities around the United States, among other ways we could be spending $80 billion a year. Wow. Yeah, there's there's a lot that you said that I want to get into, but it's it's extremely helpful to understand what started you you on that path. And and it seemed like the Chagosians, uh, from listening to your book, um, but also, you know, just talking with you, the Chagosians and kind of seeing that plight in action, you know, uh, putting flesh onto the problem was was kind of the motivator for you. Um it was. Yeah. It was, yeah. And and really I, you know, I'm greatly indebted to the Chigosians in a number of ways. Um and they changed my life and I've um tried to uh pay that back in some respects, including by donating uh the the royalties from my books to the Chigosians and, and to others. Who are victims of war. So, you know, talking about your motivation is is great. Now I want to talk a little bit about um the government and the military's motivation because I think a lot of times to be able to see the problem, you have to understand, well, you know, what's the motive? You know, in a murder case, you need the weapon, but you, but the motive is is extremely important to be able to see how things play out. So uh your book was was extremely helpful in a lot of ways in helping me see the motive. But I was kind of primed to see it because I, I had first read Smedley Butler's famous, you know, "War Is a Racket" uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, you know, for those who don't know, Major Smed, uh, Major General Smedley Butler, 
uh, he was, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think he still is the, the most decorated Marine uh, veteran in history, uh, in U.S. history. Certainly, certainly was. Uh, <laughs> okay. Either way, right? He, uh, he, um, he was definitely involved in the military, so he would have uh, had a, a bias towards wanting to prop up the, the things that he did for the military. But he comes out with this book that you know says, no, war is a racket. Like I realized that all the things they had me do was for big business and it was it was no good it was basically empire building and uh he kind of he he kind of exposes that to the world and um i think you know in your book you kind of put some more flesh more details to kind of what butler uncovered uh you you explore a number of beneficiaries of war and overseas bases so uh, countries benefit from foreign aid and in-country spending by by the troops that are stationed there. They're spending their money overseas instead of you know uh, here in the United States. Businesses get tax exemptions or um, you know benefits from from having money that's accrued overseas as opposed to in the U.S. Stockholders benefit from goods being purchased um, exorbitantly a lot of times by the the military. And uh, so the stockholders benefit construction companies and landlords overseas with the influx of bodies. And you even you can get into the mafia in Italy, which which I thought was interesting that we're, you know, we're we're helping them too. Uh, and then foreign infrastructure, which you just touched on, which um, was was a phenomenal insight to me to realize, oh, yeah, we, you know, this idea of socialism is is railed against at, you know, here in the U.S., but um you know, in military bases, you basically have have a form of of socialism and public transportation and going green and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's a ton, a ton right there. I would love for you to maybe whittle that down to a few take home points about um, what the motives are, who the who the main players are that benefit from this type of policy of overseas bases. Great questions, and I, I think it's important to point out just first of all how rare this situation is in which the U.S. military is occupying approximately 80 foreign countries and colonies with 750 military bases. This is around 700, excuse me, this is around 75 to 85 percent of the world's foreign military bases, which is to say there are a few other countries that have foreign military bases, bases on other countries' territories. Uh, the France and, and Britain have uh, a, a dozens, um, especially there the may be as many as 145 British foreign military bases. Um, France that might have a couple dozen. Uh, Russia has 12 to 36 foreign military bases. The numbers are hard to pin down because of the secretive nature of bases and because uh, the definition of a base itself is hard to establish and there are different definitions, but approximately 12 to 36 Russian foreign military bases. Compare that to 70, 750 U.S. foreign bases. Or China, eight at most, eight foreign military bases compared to the 750. So this massive uh, collection of U.S. bases abroad, it's the largest collection of foreign military bases in world history, larger than any empire or people or country in world history. And these bases, as I mentioned before, have had a range of damaging effects on people around the world, on people in the United States. In addition to some of the effects I pointed to already, these bases have had you know, intense environmental damage on the surrounding land and waters. They also have carbon footprints that increase the overall carbon footprint of the U.S. military that is um, as large as countries like Sweden, um, a massive carbon footprint contributing to global warming. Uh, these bases are also damaging locals in a range of ways, contributing to accidents and, and often U.S. military personnel sadly per, uh, perpetrate crimes against locals that, of course, doesn't tend to build a lot of uh, goodwill between the U.S. military and, and locals. Um, there are often exploitative prostitution industries around these bases. Um, and again, I, I, I pointed to the ways in which $80 billion a year, approximately, uh, 
of taxpayer funds are directed to maintain these bases every year or siphoned off from U.S. taxpayers and from the needs we have here at home. So there are a lot of ways in which these bases damage uh, literally millions of people around the world and in the United States. But as you pointed out, it's critical to see how these bases benefit some. Unfortunately, it's a very small group of businesses and elites who tend to benefit from the existence of these bases. You know, that $80 billion a year it has to go somewhere. And a lot of it goes to major military contractors who make up part of what Eisenhower identified as the military industrial complex or the military industrial congressional complex. Uh, so they are among the, the most important of the beneficiaries. As Smedley but Butler pointed out, there are US corporations operating abroad who tend to like the presence of the US military as a kind of enforcer a kind of uh, military muscle that uh, ensures their profit-making activities. Oil companies, of course, come to mind immediately, um, but others who are seeking natural resources, um, even the airline industry in some ways has benefited from U.S. bases abroad since World War II in particular. Um, so it's important to see the ways in which a small, relatively small group of elites and elite corporations have benefited mightily in the maintenance of this huge infrastructure of U.S. bases abroad, while the vast majority of people in the United States and around the world have tended to suffer. Yeah, and uh, digging into uh, into part of that as well, um, you know, when you, when you do talk about how the military bases are equipped overseas, and we do pump a lot of money into those things. We do know that that businesses benefit a lot from it, but also the the US soldiers and the people stationed on the bases benefit a lot too. And um I, I don't remember if you made this point exactly. Um I, I thought you did, but if not it it uh, at least led me to to uh following up on this. But I think you said that it it's essentially like socialism. Um where you have, you said something to the extent of like a, the top earner in the military earns only about 10 times what the, the lowest soldier earns. Um, and you have all of this, uh, you have a lack of disparity, you have equality in healthcare, you have equality in all of these things. Um, yet over here in the US, you know, you look way back in, in, um, uh, the, in terms of the civil rights movement and, and, um, in in regard to race, well, if if somebody was uh, was pro civil rights movement, they were labeled a socialist or a communist, and uh, that follows even up to today. If you're uh, in support of Black Lives Matter or something like that, then you must be a Marxist or a communist. And so this this socialism idea, we we are very against. But I think you you pictured it very well that we essentially are for socialism for our troops. Can, do you have any insight into how we can kind of hold this double standard as to um, how we can accept socialism in, in one sense, but then not in another? It's complicated, but I, I think largely most people in the United States are unaware of uh, the lives of most people in the U.S. military. Um, it's actually a relatively small percentage of the country now that that is part of the U.S. military or has a family member in the U.S. military. In the age since the end of the draft, in the that was a feature of the war in Vietnam, a smaller and smaller percentage of the country has been aware of life in the U.S. military and and life on bases abroad is a complicated mix and indeed in in some ways it is a kind of socialist utopia where in exchange for their labor, uh, military personnel and their family members benefit from a, an array of benefits, healthcare, um, basic pay, uh, the educational benefits, housing benefits. Um, often the pay, especially for those at the bottom end of the earning spectrum is, is quite low and there are people in the US military who are on food stamps. Um, so it's not, it's far from, from perfect and life on bases abroad is, is often a mix, uh, and, you know, 
people often love going to bases in Italy or Germany or Japan or South Korea and feel like they benefit from the the lifestyle there and seeing another country. And indeed, who wouldn't want that opportunity? Many people do. Um, but and, and I think it's sad that in the United States, you have to join, unless you grow up extraordinarily wealthy, you have to join the US military to get opportunities like that. Um, the Peace Corps is, is you know, a small fraction of the size of, of US military. Um, but life on bases abroad is also very difficult for families. If you bring your families, uh, if a member of the military brings their family, the family members have to leave their schools and their jobs in the United States. Um, there are a lot of challenges that come with being deployed abroad. In other cases, fam family members aren't allowed to accompany their, their often their uh, husband or father uh, who is deployed abroad and, and have to experience long-term separation from a loved one. Um, people are separated from their communities. And often, while there are many benefits to, to bases abroad, the lifestyle is, is, is very cushy in, in many ways, recreational opportunities, and in addition to the kinds of benefits I outlined, uh, they're often quite unhealthy places. There are very high rates of uh, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, substance use, um, violence between family members. Um, and we shouldn't really be surprised by this because while there is this array of, of benefits that are that are offered to people in the military, they are of course uh, enlisted to engage in violence and to kill, um, whether they're in a war zone or not. Um, this is a violent infrastructure. This is an infrastructure to commit acts of violence. And this is a, a violent uh, atmosphere in, in, in which uh, people are living. Um, so it's, it's a complicated picture, um, but it, I think as you were suggesting, offers a, a vision of, of the kind of sort of array of benefits that people in the United States could enjoy. And I think that the last thing I'll, I'll say is that, the infrastructure of 750 U.S. bases abroad is really a microcosm of choices that elites have made since World War II. In other countries, elites and their uh, and and voters have built social welfare states since World War II. In other wealthy industrialized countries in Europe and Asia uh, and some other parts of the world. People have built social welfare states that have provided for people's health, for their housing, for their educational needs, for their food needs, and other needs. In the United States, since World War II, elites have largely built a warfare state, not a welfare state. That's why we don't have universal health care in the United States. That's why you need to join the military to get the kinds of benefits that other people in other countries take for granted as a basic right of being a citizen. In the United States, you need to join the military to get those benefits, uh, rather than their being extended to all people as they could and should be here in the United States. I want to go back to something that you said just a, a few minutes ago when you were talking about other countries that have bases overseas. And um, I think you said that the, the second uh, largest overseas base holder is um, Great Britain. And uh, that's interesting because, you know, Great Britain was uh, the land on which the sun never set, right? They they were very big colonizers and uh, they had colonies all over the place. And it seems like today in the U.S., we are a land where the sun doesn't set if you consider uh, army bases, um, you know, U.S. territory all around the globe. So, uh, but yet we don't, own these territories, and maybe we don't extract resources to the the same extent uh, that they used to. We we kind of have a different uh, mo. So colonialism is a is a really dirty word today, and and we say that we're not an empire, we're not colonizing, and any of that kind of stuff. Yet your description of of a base nation, um, it kind of it seems to me that it uncovers that our military system is really just modern disguised form of colonialism. Could you explain how we've traded one form of colonialism for another 
And um, maybe I know you talk about Guam and Okinawa a lot or or um, Diego Garcia. Could you just kind of give us, paint us a picture of modern colonialism? Yeah, again, this is one of the ways in which I think the Chagossians helped change how I view the United States and, and how I view the world and the place of the United States in the world. I grew up, you know, learning about the British Empire and the French Empire and the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Chinese Empire of ancient times, uh, and didn't see the United States as, as an empire. Indeed, the United States gained its independence by freeing itself from the British Empire. I saw the United States as a, fundamentally being a democracy since independence, which of course is far from the case. Um, and the extent to which the United States is a democracy, democracy today is, is up for debate. But I think uh, with the help of the Chagossians and research I've done since I met the Chagossians to investigate the collection of U.S. bases abroad and a long series of U.S. wars that have been enabled by U.S. bases abroad, I've seen that really since independence, the United States was an empire. I mean, how did the United States get from a collection of 13 colonies that became states to occupying land across North America and then lands on islands in other parts of the world? You know, that process was disguised really in the 19th century as a, a sort of act of God, an act of manifest destiny, just a natural process. But that wasn't a natural process. It was a process of conquest, of colonization, of foreign lands, of violent conquest and colonization that took the lives of millions of Native American peoples and displaced and injured millions more. And this is what empires do they expand and conquer territory and claim territory? And this process unfolded in the 19th century. And by the end of the 19th century, the United States had begun colonizing lands outside of North America uh, as part of the 1898 war with Spain, um, leading the United States to, to occupy and colonize Puerto Rico and Guam, the Philippines, uh, and of course, to, to occupy in a de facto colonial nature, Cuba as well, with the help of the base at Guantanamo Bay. I mean, if you think about Guantanamo Bay, this also reveals that the United States, in a very formal sense, has colonies today. The United States occupies Guantanamo Bay against the will of the Cuban people. Long before the Cuban Revolution, the Cuban government wanted Guantanamo Bay back. Guantanamo Bay is sort of a micro colony, um, but we also have to think about, you know, with these 50 states, you know, this is all colonized land, but, but think too about the places that so frequently are overlooked in the United States, Guam, Puerto Rico, the American, American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, the U.S. Virgin Islands. These are places that are in a fundamentally colonial relationship to the United States. They do not have voting representation in Congress. They do not ha have the right to vote in U.S. presidential elections. Um, they do not have full citizenship. It's a second or even third class citizenship. Uh, we could also throw Washington, D.C., where I was born and um, where I teach, as another kind of quasi-colony. People at least have the right to vote for president in the United States, but do not have voting representation in Congress. So today, in addition to these colonies, it's important to see how many of the bases the United States military occupies around the world are kind of micro colonies that allow the US government to exert power and influence far beyond the actual territory occupied. So that's why some people, scholars, refer to the United States today as a kind of empire of bases, that in the post-World War II period, the United States changed as an empire and became an empire characterized by this huge, unprecedented collection of foreign military bases, again, larger than any empire or people or country in, in world history. And uh, part of the reason I investigated the effects of all these bases and, and wrote my book, Base Nation, was to, to question something that since World War II has mostly gone unquestioned, the, the, the existence of 
so many U.S. bases around the world. I think, you know, most people in the United States actually have some awareness that there are U.S. bases in Japan or Germany, for example, but rarely do they ask, wait, why, you know, now more than 75 years after the end of World War II are these bases still there? Are they protecting the United States? Are they protecting Japan and Germany? Uh, are these bases needed? Um, it's become just an accepted part of U.S. foreign policy that the United States would maintain so many bases abroad uh, when people really have not demonstrated that these bases are benefiting us in any ways. And when there are clear damage, there's clear damage being done of a whole range of kinds. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll just say is that, again, the, the, the basic assumption is the United States needs to maintain uh, all these bases abroad to protect U.S. national security. That has just been asserted by people in the mainstream foreign policy circles, by politicians, by elites. It's been asserted since World War II without providing any evidence. And when we look more closely, we see that these bases in a whole range of ways are counterproductive to protecting the United States, are actually damaging the United States in a range of ways. And you see people across the political spectrum coming to this same conclusion. It's not just me, someone you know identifies as being on the left. There are people on the right who realize, wait a second, we could be spending our money in far better ways than investing you know, $80 billion a year on bases abroad. And there are better ways to deploy the U.S. military. Focusing on protecting the borders of the United States would actually be a, a far more advantageous way to protect U.S. national security, uh, in addition to a whole range of other ways in which U.S. bases overseas are actually undermining the security and safety of the United States and its people. Yeah, I can understand why people would be upset if they're, uh, you know, if they're under the the heel of uh, colonialism, if they feel that way. And it, it seems like we know that that's what we're doing too. Um, because one of the things that you explore in your book is is the way that we kind of use language to, um, you know, manipulate, manipulate um, appearances. So for example, you talk about lily pads. Uh, why does, what is a lily pad and why does the military use that term? So a lily pad is a kind of small U.S. military base overseas. Uh, these have become increasingly popular really since the turn of the century when U.S. military personnel and U.S. government officials were concerned about some of the opposition that bases abroad were generating protests like you see in Okinawa. You mentioned Okinawa, where there's been protest against U.S. military bases and the U.S. military presence since at least the 1950s. Uh, the U.S. military personnel and U.S. leaders began looking for small, isolated bases that would be insulated from protest and opposition. And uh, lily pads were one of the kinds of bases that, that served this purpose. They, they tend to be much smaller than the huge city-sized bases in Germany and Japan. These have a few hundred troops on them, no, no family members, and not as many of the amenities that you would find on the, on the big bases. Uh, but they've allowed the U.S. military to uh, exert power and influence, uh, and the U.S. government more broadly to exert power and influence in parts of the world where there wasn't formerly a U.S. military presence, such as in large parts of, of Africa, especially North and East and, and West Africa. And the, um, I'm sorry if you're getting some some noise from someone, one, someone in my neighborhood is, um, but anyway, um, so lily pad bases uh, are, as you pointed out, also a linguistic way to hide a U.S. military presence. Sometimes they're actually physically within uh, a foreign government's military base, as in the Philippines. Um, and in a range of ways, uh, U.S. leaders have, have used language to disguise the, the presence of, of U.S. military forces abroad and, and basically to keep people in the United States ignorant of what the U.S. military is doing around the world to keep them from asking the kinds of questions that we should be asking about what they're doing and whether it's benefiting anyone 
including people in the United States. And I guess at some points, the way that the linguistics work is you can functionally, uh, they work functionally as well, because if you label something not a base, then it doesn't, it goes on a different budget item. Is that correct? That's certainly one of the kinds of games that that, that U.S. military leaders have, have played, and and frequently, yeah, the, it's part of why it's hard to have a precise figure of the total number of U.S. bases abroad. Even the Pentagon doesn't know how many bases abroad it has. Um, so, but but often um, U.S. leaders engage engage in intentional manipulation of language to hide or disguise the presence of the U.S. military overseas. Um, and this is one of the, the challenges of, of really getting a clearer sense of, of the impact of the U.S. military and the U.S. war system around the world. Yeah, linguistics uh, fascinate me when you when you look at all the ways that they're they're used. Um, I remember one of one of the interesting ones to me was uh, when I first found out that President Roosevelt in his day of infamy speech, um, he after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, we, we're familiar with the version that he gave, but uh, it went through a number of edits. And, you know, he, he uh, more places than Hawaii were bombed. Uh, and Hawaii at that time was not a state. It was a, it was a territory, U.S. territory. But, um, you know, the Philippines were bombed and uh, Guam and, and other places were being attacked by Japan. Uh, and they had originally been included in his speech, but he kind of scratched them all out and said, uh, you know, the American island of Oahu. And uh, so, you know, instead of just saying Oahu or Hawaii, the American island, right? So it it almost became a part of of us. And I wonder, you know, I wonder if that's why it uh, it became a U.S. state a little bit later because of, you know, that connection. But anyway, it's, uh, you know, those linguistics are, are really powerful in shaping and, and politicians and people know that. Um, but what's one of the things that I find fascinating is when you talked about Guam, and you talk about all the people who um, don't like the military bases there and kind of feel oppressed in a sense, and they don't have voting rights, uh, they don't have the rights of full citizens, yet they can join the U.S. military. And you you said that, I, I don't think you gave a statistic, but you said that quite a number of people do. Um, and that just made me think, you know, uh, I forget uh, the author Ferrari, Fieri, um, the P pedagogy of the oppressed, but it's a it's a famous book, and uh, in it he talks about how the oppressed often um, kind of contributes to their own oppression and and kind of join in on on the system. Um, can you talk at all? I don't know if you have any exposure to in Guam in particular, but why would so many people um, join a military that they feel oppressed by? What What's going on in their minds? What has the military done? What does the U.S. do to kind of incentivize that sort of thing? It's complicated, but but economics play a really important role. Um, I was lucky enough to visit Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands, and after being introduced to the Chagosians again to, to research my book, Base Nation, I wanted to see these bases around the world and, and what impact they were having. Uh, so I went to Guam where there is indeed great support for the military by, by many, uh, as well as growing opposition among many who are questioning whether the military presence there, which is quite substantial, it's really, a, a, I think around 25% of the island of Guam is occupied by the US military currently. I try to imagine in your own community, 25% of the land occupied by the U.S. military. And, you know, it's been that way more or less uh, since the United States seized and, and occupied Guam after the end of the, the War of 1898 with, with Spain. And that war brought colonial occupation at the time U.S. leaders proudly talked about these new colonies. Now, going back to the question of language, we uh, people tend to refer to Guam and Puerto Rico and the American Samoa as, as territories, but they're fundamentally in a colonial relationship with the United States, and I think properly should be called colonies to reflect that colonial relationship. And the attachment, the occupation by the United States has not tended to bring prosperity. The reason there are so many 
people from Guam in the US military and so many from American Samoa and the Northern Mariana Islands, among other places, is because there are so few economic opportunities. And uh, as in other parts of the United States, in the 50 states, uh, the military is, is one way that people can feed themselves and ensure that they can feed themselves and their families and have a, a decent style of life, which then tends to lead to support for the institution itself that is the U.S. military. Well, and I guess have- one, one of the things in your book you talk about is that um, on a lot of these military bases, the U.S. actually has you know, they, they bring in a lot of Filipinos and people from, from other places to work. So if you're on Guam, I guess you either join the military and get all the benefits or you work for substandard pay at a military base. So either way, you're working for the military. If they take up 25% of your island, I mean, that's a lot of your jobs. It, indeed, indeed. I, uh, you know, there are some other jobs, um, but it is a hugely military dependent community. And then, you know, so you might say, well, this is great. Um, but, but you know, what we see in Guam and elsewhere is that the military has not created thriving economic uh, opportunities. It hasn't created thriving economies. Um, and if you think about what military bases do, they, they take up large amounts of land and they don't really produce anything. Um, so they're not a great basis for building an economy. Um, and indeed, in many ways have, have kept Guam and other places um, economically depressed. Um, but meanwhile, there are many people who are quite supportive of the military because their jobs come either directly or indirectly from the military presence. At the same time, there are, as I said, a growing number of people in Guam and elsewhere who are increasingly protesting the US military presence. They are seeing how the military has damaged their land, literally damaged the local environment. They are seeing you know, plans right now to build a military gun range on sacred lands of the ancestors of the local indigenous Chamorro people. They're seeing the ways in which being a huge US military base actually makes you a target. So Guam is closer to China than uh, to Washington, DC. Um, or most of the United States. Uh, And if there was ever any war between China and the United States, and we should hope that nothing remotely like a war between China and the United States ever happens, uh, Guam would be in the crosshairs. And people in Guam are increasingly aware of this. And right right now they're experiencing a buildup of US military forces. Um, But this is not going to protect Guam. In fact, it's just making them more of a target, uh, endangering and undermining their security and safety. So another place um, that you talk about is Diego Garcia. And um, I know that's that's particularly close to your heart. Um, And and you talk about how uh, the U.S. military has harmed the Chagossians. So one of the one of the things that stuck out to me uh, in your story about them is the linguistic propaganda that that was kind of used in all of this to kind of shade what was going on differently. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the the Chagossians. I know you already did a little bit. Maybe fill in a little bit more details and and talk about how they were labeled as migrant laborers and how that um, you know influenced perception of what the military was doing. Sure. I think, you know, the Chagossian story is part of the construction of the U.S. military base on Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean reveals a lot about how the war system has worked and how the U.S. government has worked, especially since World War II, and how U.S. leaders have frequently lied to the American public and to the rest of the world. Um now, first of all, the Chagossians are also an example of the way in which U.S. bases abroad have have harmed locals very directly by displacing them from their lands. In fact, I've been able to document more than 20 cases in which the U.S. military has displaced local, mostly indigenous peoples around the world uh, since the end of the 19th century as part of the construction or expansion of U.S. military facilities. So the Chagossians are are sadly not unique. And of course, their displacement followed the late 18th century and 19th century experience of Native American peoples in North America, who of course were displaced by the millions from their lands as part of the 
colonial conquest of the US empire uh, expanding across North America. But the Chagosians, you know, it is a kind of 19th century story of colonialism played out in the late 20th and 21st century. In the 1950s and 60s, US military officials and other government officials identified Diego Garcia as a place they wanted to build a military base and they wanted it without a local population. And they paid the British government 14 million pounds secretly in a way that uh, avoided the oversight of Congress and parliament. Uh, they paid the British government to do the dirty work of getting rid of the Chagosians. Uh, US officials were very, and British officials were, were very upfront about it. Um, and they crafted a public relations strategy with the help of, of British officials to call the Chagosians migrant or transient laborers, uh, rather than the local native indigenous people that they knew them to be, that they had been living there for generations. They weren't migrant laborers. Uh, and, but this is how US government officials represented the Chagosians when asked uh, by members of Congress uh, and at the UN. And this was a way to hide what they were doing, displacing a, an indigenous people. Um, and uh, again, sadly reflects the kind of lying that, that US government officials engage in far too often. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I don't know the history too much. I, I remember you referenced the Bikini Atoll and did we displace people from there too and basically move them off of that island? Exactly. I'm glad okay. you you asked about them. Um, yes, in the in the Marshall Islands, Bikini At the Bikini Atoll is probably the most well known island where the United States military engaged in nuclear testing after World War II. And as part of that nuclear testing, uh, at least five, uh, and perhaps more, diff separate groups of people from different atolls, different groups of islands, uh, were displaced from their lands. Um, from their islands, entire islands, um, during nuclear testing. Uh, and, you know, some of the other examples of local, again, mostly indigenous peoples who've been displaced include people in Hawaii and in parts of Guam and Okinawa. Um, some in Okinawa were, were displaced to Bolivia, of all places, across the Pacific Ocean. Um, in Puerto Rico, people were displaced from their lands. Um, so sadly, the, the Chagosian experience is, is far from unique. Um, and, and like other people, the Chagosians are, are still struggling to get back to their homeland. Uh, the people of the Bikini Atoll and, and other islands in the Marshall Islands have, have been struggling to go back home as well, and often to get proper compensation. And, and I think these are struggles that we should want to support as a matter of, of basic justice that, you know, Shouldn't we all have the right to live in our homeland? Why, why should some be displaced against their will um, when others can live in the, uh, the the comfort of their homes? And really, right there, I'm, I'm paraphrasing one of the Chagosian leaders, Olivier Bancou, um, who's asked these these basic questions: Why, you know, why do some get human rights and others not? Why do some get to live in their homelands and others not. Uh, and he rightly asks whether it's a matter of race because all but one of the peoples who the US military has displaced since the late 19th century have been peoples of color. Um, there was one, one case in, in Canada where um, locals were displaced uh, during World War II, but all the others were uh, local brown and black folks, indigenous peoples, uh, displaced against their will. And so uh, I think that, uh, you know, using uh, Olivia Bancou's insights uh, underlines the, the racism that has been fundamental to the U.S. military base system and to the larger war system. Um, quick side question here, because I don't know the answer to this, but as I was uh, researching Diego Garcia a bit, and um, it called it the footprint of freedom. Where does that name come from? Do you have any any idea? It's a name that people in the U.S. military uh, applied to Diego Garcia, and there are nicknames for many of the bases abroad, including Guam, which gets called the tip of the spear sometimes. But the saddest thing about Footprint of Freedom, I don't know when it first was applied to Diego Garcia, is 
just the awful irony that, you know, calling the space the footprint of freedom uh, means for the Chagosians. I mean, what kind of freedom do they have living in, in exile, separated from their homelands and living for the most part in profound poverty? Meanwhile, it's, you know, the kind of propagandistic language, really Orwellian language, um, because this island, this base has not provided freedom hasn't provided freedom for the United States. It's been a launch pad for catastrophic wars, catastrophic wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq, throughout the Middle East, uh, wars that have not provided freedom to anyone in the United States or around the world, but instead have inflicted horrific damage to countries like Afghanistan and Iraq, where hundreds of thousands of people have died at minimum. Um, likely the, the totals run into the, the millions, while tens of millions have been injured um, and millions have been displaced from their homes. This is freedom? I, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't sure who named that. It wouldn't have been good either way, no matter who named it. But um, yeah, it feels, it feels kind of like a slap in the face that uh, the U.S. military named it the footprint of freedom. You know, like, well... We'll step on you, and the, we're we're okay with that cost if it if it means freedom for us, right? Very well put. Although, again, I think we need to question whether it has brought right. any freedom to people in the United States or the U.S. military. And in fact, I would say that quite the opposite has been been the case. Yeah, and that that perfectly leads us into the uh, the last section. I want to to try to keep it. Uh, right about an hour. I'm going to limit myself to the last two big questions that I want to ask you. Um, so we talked about, you know, the motive for, for the military and the government to do what it does. And then we've largely focused on the linguistic aspect of, of kind of how propaganda functions, but, um, you know, in order to be able to, to wield propaganda effectively, you know, Jacques Ellul and a lot of other people who talk about uh, propaganda identify that, you know, like all good salesmen, you need to provide a need. And, uh, a lot of times fear is is the thing that you apply you know if if i can make you scared that you're not going to get something that you need um then you're susceptible to propaganda or if i can create a need that you think uh that you don't really have but i make you think you have it um and that only i can provide it yeah you know, i can i can elicit fear in you and you're going to believe me as your savior and so um you know, if you look across the world, um, the the U.S. has um, kind of espoused for the Middle East. We we talk about terrorism, and for South America, historically, we've talked about um, communism was big back in the day, but now it's drugs. Uh, we've talked about those two things as a result of fear, uh, or, or uh, to elicit fear in order to be the saviors, and um, and that's allowed us to grow our bases. Uh, and our our military presence, but like you said, um, you know, it, you think that this ends up becoming a self fulfilling prophecy, and rather than bringing freedom, it actually um, creates the problems that we've uh, manufactured to to make people fear. Could you talk a little bit about the manufacturing of fear and how that's um, a, a double edged sword or or a boomerang that ends up coming back to us? I will do my best. Uh, um, great, great questions, uh, complicated questions. But indeed, what we've seen is U.S. leaders have frequently justified the presence of U.S. spaces abroad by pointing to supposed dangers. And what we've seen is that conveniently, there have been a rotating series of justifications, and frequently it's moved, as you pointed out, from we have to protect against communism, to the war on drugs, to terrorism. And there's always, strangely enough, a, a, a justification, a reason. Um, and some of this is cynical manipulation by U.S. officials who are seeking to get, you know, larger budgets for their part of the military or justify a large total U.S. military budget, which just by the way, people should know, the total Pentagon budget now is upwards of $1 trillion a year, $1 trillion a year, which is really sort of inconceivable. Um, and again, we need to think about what we're not spending that money on. Um, but 
the 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 use of of fear mongering is a long standing strategy uh, that that dates especially to World War II and the inflation of the Soviet threat, and in more recent years, in addition to the war on drugs and terrorism, of course, we've seen the inflation of the Russian threat, the Russian military threat, and the Chinese military threat, whose militaries are, in terms of capability and their funding a small fraction of the size of the, the US military. And meanwhile, they're portrayed as being these um, existential threats. And this you know, serves the purpose of inflating US military budget, budgets uh, in, in ways that, that you mentioned the sort of self-fulfilling nature of, of these dynamics. So I, one of my greatest fears is that, uh, especially with China, for example, U.S. military leaders and other elites, people, think tanks, and mainstream foreign policy circles have for years been inflating the China threat and saying that we have to respond with more bases, with more military spending, with more military force. And, you know, how would the United States respond if China were to build even a single military base anywhere near the borders of the United States? Again, the only foreign bases China has are in Djibouti, in the east coast of Africa, and some in the South China Sea on disputed islands. China has no bases anywhere near U.S. borders. Meanwhile, the United States has encircled China with dozens of military bases uh, since World War II and an increasing number of bases in, in, in recent years, um, and more than 100, not just dozens. Um, if the shoe were on the other foot, U.S. citizens, U.S. leaders would be calling for a major military buildup in response to the threat of Chinese bases near our borders. So how do we expect China to respond if the U.S. increases its military presence near their borders with bases, with troops, with uh, the highest powered, often nuclear weaponry? Um, this is creating and only encouraging the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese government, to build up its military forces and power, uh, raising the likelihood of, of a war, either in, through an accidental conflict or, or, or something that's not accidental. And again, the idea of any uh, conflict, any war between nuclear armed powers uh, should be unthinkable. But now the threat of a war between the United States and both China and Russia is greater than it's been at any point uh, since uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1960s, and which means that the threat of nuclear annihilation for entire human species is a greater threat than at any point since the 1960s. And this should alarm all of us to say the least and should mean that all of us do everything we can do to make the likelihood of any such war less and less likely, which means bringing down tensions and bringing down the kinds of military spending and US military buildup that has not made any of us safer, but instead has, again, made war more likely. Yeah, I, I think you actually do get a vision of uh, how we would respond with the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, um, it, it wasn't Russia exactly putting a base um, in our hemisphere, but you know, when, when nuclear weapons were on Cuba, that's, that's not fair, but we'll, we'll have our, uh, nuclear missiles in Turkey and aimed at you, Russia, right across the black sea. And that's, that's perfectly legitimate. Exactly. Well, yeah, it was a, a Russian missile base in, in Cuba that was the inciting incident for the Cuban missile crisis. And, and when thinking about the 750, U.S. military bases in 80 foreign countries and colonies. Again, I think I think it is helpful, and I'm glad you brought up that case. I think it's helpful for people in the United States in particular to think, how would we feel if Russia or China had a military base anywhere near our borders in, for example, Canada or Mexico? How would that feel? Meanwhile, China and Russia are surrounded by literally hundreds of U.S. military bases. Uh, again, only encouraging them to respond militarily. Uh, this is not a way to ensure the safety and security of the world. This is a, a recipe for ramping up military tensions and making war more likely.
Okay, last question for you. Um, so, so you can go as long or short as you want here. Uh, one of the things that was was preached to me from birth was that uh, you know we're a democracy. I I have to vote. My voice counts. Um, and and you even brought up at the beginning, uh, you know this this um, this you said that you know whether or not we live in a democracy or how democratic it is is questionable and i think that's going to raise eyebrows for a lot of people um because we're indoctrinated with this idea that our voice matters and and uh, we are a democracy and it's something that we we preach as like a core value of what we are as the united states and a lot of our wars are to uh, one of the points uh, one of the the goals is to bring democracy to other nations um, we value it so much that we we will go and kill other people to make sure that uh, they have it. Yet at the same time, you you look back through our history and um, South America alone, all the coups and democratically elected officials that we overthrew, uh, Iran, Middle East, a bunch of different places. Uh, Haiti, I know we've overthrown a, a bunch of people. Um, we, we preach democracy, uh, and in your book, you talk about Franco, how we kind of were, were buddies with him and supported him. We support all kinds of dictators, and we overthrow democracies all over the place. Can you explain a little bit about how we have this double standard of preaching democracy and how that's used to garner support from, from the populace for war, while simultaneously we show that we don't really value democracy abroad, and then kind of a follow-up does that have implications for whether or not we truly value democracy at home? Great questions. And I think, you know, look no further than the presence of US military bases in at least 38 less than democratic countries. US military bases are in at least 38 countries that are ruled by undemocratic regimes, often murderous dictatorial regimes like regimes in Saudi Arabia and other parts of the Persian Gulf um, and some parts of Africa and Thailand. Um, the United States, and this has been the case since World War II, um, the United States has, by virtue of the presence of U.S. bases in undemocratic countries, helped prop up undemocratic regimes, far from spreading democracy as sometimes been claimed. I, I think it's it's clear that the language of spreading democracy and supporting democracy has been a kind of propaganda, a kind of marketing. I mean, yes, there are some ways in which the U.S. government has supported the spread of democracy, mostly through uh, the activities of some of the activities of the U.S. State Department or of U.S. Agency for International Development, to some marginal extent, the Peace Corps. Um, but U.S. foreign policy, U.S. relations with the rest of the world are dominated by the military. And this has brought not democracy, but instead, you know, really awful death and suffering through the wars that we have waged unnecessarily in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't, I don't think most people in the United States have really grappled just, just for the last now 21 years of war. Since the attacks of 9-11, the 9-11 the wars um, have brought a, a degree of suffering and, and, and death that, that I think most people in the United States, again, have no clue about. Uh, the, by my estimate, the post-9-11 wars, the, or just the 9-11 wars, uh, first launched by George W. Bush, but then you know, continued by Obama, Trump, and, and Biden to a lesser extent, uh, have probably taken the lives of around 4.5 million people, 4.5 million people in the war zones, including US military personnel, but they're a small portion, 4.5 million people. That's about the same as died in roughly 20 years of US led war in, in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, 4.5 million people. Is that democracy? Um, war is, fundamentally undemocratic, of course. And yes, we should question and reject the, the use of democracy as cover for uh, imperial domination and imperial expansion. Uh, 
uh, and while also questioning the extent to which there is democracy at home, beginning with the, the colonies we've talked about where people don't have democratic rights or full democratic rights. And then, you know, in the U.S. states where people are having their basic right to vote stripped left and right, um, especially in Republican controlled states, um, especially people of color, African-Americans in particular, who um, in disproportionate ways are being prevented from voting through a whole variety of mechanisms. And of course, there are many other ways in which uh, the United States is not a full democracy, but just starting there, um, we need to deeply question. Um, anytime you hear a politician or a leader or lead talking about the United States being a fountain of democracy at home or abroad, we should really pay even closer attention because they're probably lying to us. Yeah, there's there's so much there. Um, you know, mentioning Saudi Arabia, I I only uh, found out about the what was going on in Yemen maybe a year ago. Like that that's not plastered all over the news um, over here, despite how huge the numbers are of deaths and uh, you know malnutrition and everything are because our friends are doing it. Which also shed some light, you know, when um, the journalist um, uh, do you remember his name from Saudi Arabia who was killed? Khashoggi. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and there, you know, we didn't really slap them on the on the hand or anything. So yeah, when you understand who we're buddies with, it it really brings a lot of what you don't see in the media to light, but as well as what uh what you do see uh with with who we reprimand and who we fight and who we don't. So so understanding that there's a base uh and you know in various countries is helpful. Um so and that, that's why I think, you know. It, trying to expose this huge collection of bases and encourage people to question whether we need them, why they're there, what damage they're causing, whether there are better ways to protect the United States and people around the world, which I think clearly there are, to say the least, um, is important to encourage people to, to call for the a change. Um, I guess I would just point to, um, for, for people who are interested, I'm part of a group of people across the political spectrum who are questioning the huge collection of U.S. bases abroad called the, we have a coalition called the Overseas Base Realignment and Closure Coalition, and people can learn more about it at overseasbases.net, overseasbases.net, and my website, davidvine.net, and basenation.us, two websites, davidvine.net and basenation.us, have information about this, the war system and the collection of bases, but also um, offers links to movements and organizations who are seeking urgently to change the status quo and ensure the United States uh, pursues a more peaceful path in the future uh, than the, the violent history of war that that, that US leaders have, have, um, have pursued for decades and really since U.S. independence. Yeah, and you also have a, a newer book out that uh, maybe you want to plug and talk about, The U.S. of War. Uh, what does that add to the, the conversation here? Yeah, again, people can learn more about my, my newest book, The United States of War, um, at my website, davidvine.net. Um, but really, it, it uses uh, the lens of, of U.S. military bases abroad that U.S. elites, U.S. leaders have built since independence as a way to, to reveal how the United States, far from being a, a fountain of democracy and peace, has really been in a, a very fundamental way a United States of war, that, that war has been the norm in U.S. history, that there are actually only about 11 years in U.S. history when the U.S. military has not been engaged in a war or some other form of combat. The, the last 21 years of continuous war since 9-11 is not an aberration. It's, it's the norm in U.S. history. And these have not been defensive wars by and large. These have been wars of choice, offensive wars that have uh, led to millions upon millions of deaths and injuries numbering into the tens of millions, just mass displacement. Uh, this is what our country is in many ways. And this is why I am joining with others to uh, 
try to urgently transform U.S. foreign policy and the choices that our leaders make to, to make the United States a United States of peace, not a United States of war. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate your insight and uh, your willingness to do this. Derek, thanks for the great questions and the great conversation. I, I really appreciate it. Sure. That's all for now. So peace, and because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. This podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.